This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. We end today's show with pioneering legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw to talk about her work on intersectionality and critical race theory. After the College Board removed her writings from the required curriculum for its AP African American Studies class, the College Board recently revised its curriculum for an advanced placement African American Studies course and removed Black Lives Matter, slavery, reparations, and queer theory as required topics, while adding a section on black conservatism. The new curriculum was released on the first day of Black History Month and came after Florida's Republican Governor Ron DeSantis vowed to ban the AP Black Studies class in Florida schools and Florida's education department because he said the course, quote, lacks educational value. DeSantis is expected to announce his plans to run for president in the coming months, and this all comes as teachers across the country face increasing concern about what they're allowed to include in their curriculum as Republicans use the culture wars to build their brand. They're not only concerned teachers about being criticized, but being imprisoned. On Friday, we spoke to two professors who work, whose work has been removed from the new curriculum, E. Patrick Johnson and Kianga Yamada-Taylor, who both teach at Northwestern, as well as to Harvard Kennedy School professor Khalil Gibran Mohammed. Today, we're joined by another one of the band. Professor Kimberly Crenshaw, leading scholar in the field of critical race theory, coined the term intersectionality to study the overlapping or intersecting social identities and systems of oppression, domination or discrimination people experience. Executive director of the African American Policy Forum, professor of law at both UCLA and Columbia University, joining us from New York after receiving the Winslow Medal from the Yale School of Public Health, the school's highest honor which recognizes outstanding achievements in public health leadership, scholarship, or contribution to society. Congratulations, Professor Crenshaw, on that honor. And Thank you. Um, some consider it honor now to be banned, though they're infuriated by it. <laughs> um, and I'm wondering yeah. what your thoughts are. Now, to be clear, the College Board said they made this decision to, for example, exclude your work from the required course before DeSantis made this last statement a few weeks ago. Yes, yes. Well, thank you, Amy. It's good to be back. You know, I think that the focus of the debate so far has perhaps misdirected uh, the conversation by discussing whether the ban or, I would say, benching of some of our work from required uh, text to optional text came at the behest of uh, Governor DeSantis. The reality is that there has been anti-woke uh, legislation uh, since, uh, basically, uh, President Trump uh, said, uh, stand by, uh, Proud Boys, I got something uh, for you. And what he came up with was uh, a ban on a whole range of uh, racial justice and equity ideas and practices and policies. Now, that got rescinded uh, as soon as uh, President Biden took office. But then it became a, a, a state-based strategy. At this point, uh, upwards of 42 states have considered uh, banning uh, a certain set of ideas, certain set of uh, uh, practices and concepts uh, under the, the frame of anti-wokeness or, or, or anti-CRT. So, you know, it really doesn't matter much whether the College Board uh, came to these decisions two weeks ago or two months ago. Uh, this conversation has been going on for nearly two years, if not more. You don't become a, a billion-dollar corporation by not paying attention to the market. And the market indicators told the College Board that this new course that they were hoping uh, to promote, and, and interestingly enough, the opportunity for the course came after the George Floyd activation, drove so many people in the streets, and they were demanding more information about structural racism, more information about intersectionality, more information about implicit bias. The same motivation that made people demand it also sparked, sparked a, a, a backlash in this legislation. So, of course, the College Board knew about it. Of course, the College Board um, had to take some kind of awareness, and we don't have to speculate about it. They've effectively told us that. When the course was announced, 
um, this summer, uh, some of the uh, advocates for the course went to great pains to say uh, that this course was not CRT. Um, it, the, the effort was to distinguish it as much as possible. In reality, what that was signaling was a softness in the resolve to step forward with the ideas that had been associated with CRT. That is structural racism, uh, the movement for black lives, intersectionality. So there was the opportunity, there was the motivation, um, and there was ultimately uh, the, the content elimination, or I would just say benching of some of these ideas. That's what we should be talking about, not when the memo went out. So, Professor Crenshaw, I wanted to quote the Pulitzer Prize-winning Washington Post columnist Eugene Robinson, who wrote, "...educators must not allow the phrase critical race theory to be used to blacklist scholars the same way the word communist was used in the McCarthy era. Black history is our collective history as Americans. It must be told in full." And I think it's very interesting, also, um, in light of today, to talk about the new McCarthy era, given the House Speaker, Kevin McCarthy. But your thoughts? <laughs> well, I was uh, delighted to see that someone noticed this. Uh, as, as you know, Amy, I've been talking about this since 2020. Uh, I've been saying that the whole anti-CRT, anti-woke uh, approach to legislation uh, is a very old idea. It's basically an idea that says uh, greater uh, attention to equity, uh, greater attention to equality uh, effectively uh, amounts to reverse discrimination. It's anti-white. Now, this is a far-right talking point that wasn't often expressed in, in polite company uh, for—until, uh, uh, effectively, Barack Obama was elected and then uh, President Trump, and now it's become um, uh, mainstream. And the way that it has been made uh, mainstream is by stoking fears about a set of ideas that most people couldn't tell you one thing about, except for the fact that they've been told to be afraid of these ideas, that it's taking something away from them, um, and they should repudiate it. That is a classic form uh, of McCarthyism. And what makes it so uh, uh, disturbing is the fact that people who know better people who know this history were willing to sit it out, to think that it was going to go away uh, when uh, the conversation changed, or to think that they could outrun the shadow by simply saying, we don't do critical race theory, without paying attention to what the critics said critical race theory uh, was, what they were going after. All of these ideas, but more importantly, Amy, they've said they're going after public education. They said they're going after university. So nobody can be surprised when suddenly this effort to stump out a critical race theory turns out to be an effort to make anti racism unspeakable, to make uh, queer studies undoable, to make intersectionality one of the most uh, widespread concepts across the disciplines, something that college directed students cannot uh, uh, take or can only take uh, if the states allow them to. Um, anybody who's concerned about our democracy, anyone who's concerned about authoritarianism, has to wake up and pay attention to this, because this is how it happens. I want to go to the Congressional Black Caucus chair, uh, Nevada Congressman Stephen Horsford, speaking after their caucus meeting at the White House Thursday with President Biden and Vice President Harris. We were here, as you know, to discuss the importance of public safety, uh, policing and justice. Uh, we are doing this in part uh, in response to Tyree Nichols. Uh, a young man who should be alive today, uh, a person who was a son and a father who loved photography and skateboarding. We have agreement on how we will continue to work forward, both from a legislative standpoint as well as uh, executive and community-based solutions, but the focus will always be on public safety public safety for all communities, because we understand that it is about the culture of policing and keeping all communities safe. And all of us should be able to agree that bad policing has no place in any American city or community.
So that's uh, the Congressional Black Caucus chair, Stephen Horsford, with a group of uh, CBC Congress members who just met with Harris and Biden. Um, and, of course, you had Vice President Harris speaking at uh, Tyree Nichols' funeral, uh, where she called for the passage of the George Floyd uh, Justice and Policing Act. Um, and I think Cory Booker yesterday, one of the key people pushing that, all but conceded that's not going to happen. Maybe smaller points will happen, for example, banning chokeholds, except in life-threatening situations when will police claim that uh, their lives are threatened, set federal standards for no-knock warrants, um, limit transfer of some military equipment to local departments. But I'm bringing all this up in relation to this, because Black Lives Matter, which grew up in response to uh, the killing of young black men and women, um, is now not required in the curriculum. Well, this is why um, we need to listen very carefully tomorrow to see if the president backs up his conversation um, with a clear directive to the American people that the uh, question of uh, police brutality uh, is a vital concern, and that efforts to promote uh, the, the, the value of black lives uh, cannot be silenced and cannot be sidelined. Look, the, 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 the movement for black lives, the, the mobilization that took place in 2020, was the largest mobilization in American history. We all know that there is no chance of pushing forward any fundamental change, any kind of serious legislation to address our social problems, without an active social movement that creates frame alignment, that fr creates a, the notion that this is an important issue. What can signal that the movement for black lives, that the, the problem of police brutality is less significant than it needs to be, than taking it out as a, a required reading in a course on African-American studies. So it's up to the president, it's up to leadership to step into this, to reverse uh, this faction that has basically tried to make racism unspeakable, to reverse the accommodationism that is at play when profit motives uh, come into uh, tension with the basic uh, imperative of African-American studies, which is to understand the condition, not simply as an assortment of fun facts, but as the material interests that need to be understood in order to transform this country into the multiracial democracy that it truly claims to be. You were just referring to President Biden tomorrow night, Tuesday night. Of course, he's giving a State of the Union address. Then he'll be launching a 20-state post-State of the Union blitz with his cabinet uh, to discuss the economic agenda. What do you think needs to be the message conveyed throughout this country right now? Well, I think the message needs to be uh, uh, conveyed that we are about to go into a political period uh, that is uh, uh, not unlike the political period in 1876. It's not unlike uh, 1968, in which race is on the agenda, whether explicitly or implicitly. The Democrats have never really been effective we since— have 30 um, seconds. Uh, Lee Atwater made it clear that race was going to be used uh, as a political cudgel. So this is the opportunity to prepare Americans to support uh, the idea behind multiracial democracy, not allow race to get into the way, and say what they stand for once and for all.